Well, good evening. Thank you for being with us for our midweek devotional this week. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to pick up on the Sunday morning Bible study from last Sunday morning. The Sunday morning Bible study was on Romans 14. Romans 14 is one of the more uh, challenging chapters to our thinking sometimes in the way that we live on a daily basis and the way that we treat others. And as I thought back on that Bible study, I'll confess to you that I ran out of time. I uh, just had worked my way through about two-thirds of it, and I decided, okay, I'm just going to go back and pick up the rest of that on Wednesday evening. The three functional elements of instruction are explanation, illustration, and application. And so uh, we had worked through the explanation part and through the illustration part to some degree, but had not applied it to uh, particular types of things. And so what I want to do in this Bible study is to move to some application of Romans 14. And to do that, I'm going to read from the last part of that chapter as Paul essentially worked the application uh, in his teaching to, to the Christian church at Rome. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat, because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith, Paul tells us, is sin. At another place in this chapter, he reminds us that each of us will give an account of ourself to God. So what I want to do uh, in this uh, follow-up or this closing part is to make a couple of applications, drawing on personal experience and observation, uh, just because essentially all of us live our Christian life and we experience it, and some of it we tend to learn through other people's experience. Some of the things that we choose to live by, we live through other people's experience. But most of what we uh, learn is what we do each day. In fact, it's, it's safe to say that unless we're doing what we have been taught, we have not truly learned it. And so I'm going to make reference to a couple of things in my own experience that uh, have brought this into focus for me and hopefully per and perhaps it will help you uh, with clarifying your thinking on this as well. In 1980 and 81, now I'm dating myself. I, I recognize that, that I'm gray-headed. Some of you listening to this are not gray-headed. Uh, but I'm dating myself a little bit. But in 1980 and 81 in Tuscaloosa, the big debate in, in the social circles, in certain social circles, not all social circles, was the introduction of alcoholic beverages into the grocery stores. This was just beginning to be presented, and it, it really, it raged in the newspaper, uh, letters to the editor, uh, people talked about it in various settings. It was just a scandalous thing to think of alcohol being sold in the grocery stores. Now, up to that point, if someone wanted to purchase alcoholic beverages, they had to go to a specialty store, perhaps to a convenience store, or to a private club or a bar or something like that. Well, uh, there, was, there was this big debate going on. And so I'm watching all of this with, with some interest, uh, primarily just because I had, uh, in my own experience growing up, uh, I had seen the abuses, that uh, the results of what the abuses of alcohol could cause. And so I'd gone off in the service uh, right out of high school and, and really saw quite a lot of bad behavior and saw some people who ruined their life and their potential career in the military uh, through the abuse of alcohol. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a, watching this thing in 1980 and 81. I was the pastor at the time at the Vance Baptist Church, a uh, little village outside of Tuscaloosa. Well, in January of 1982, Carol and I moved to New Orleans to go to seminary. 
We moved there on New Year's Eve, 1981. She had a job starting at Chevron. Uh, and so <clears throat> that job would start like just after the New Year's holiday. And then I was going to finish up the semester where I was teaching uh, at a private school at that time. And then I would move down to, uh, to be with her. And then I'd start classes at late January there at seminary. And so we moved her on the New Year's Eve weekend and got set up uh, there. We had purchased a mobile home that was on the campus. And so we got set up, went to the grocery store. The closest grocery store was the Swagman Brothers grocery store on Gentilly Boulevard, maybe a mile or thereabouts from the seminary campus. It was basically within walking distance. We drove, but, but one could walk there if they wanted to. Well, we went into that grocery store, and this was a whole different experience. Uh, when we walked in the grocery store, I happened to look to my right, and there was a bar room in that grocery store. And, and so, you know, uh, I'll be honest with you, at different times of my life, I've been in bar rooms. I recognized it for what it was. If you've never been in one, I, I'll tell you that doesn't get you a, to the head of the line going to heaven. But if you've never been in one, that's fine. But you've seen them on television or whatever. It was just exactly like whatever you imagined it to be or have seen it to be. But I'm, look, you know, I said, man, that's different. And, and so there are guys in there and they're reading the newspaper and they're watching television on sports bar kind of thing. This is a long time before we had a restaurant with big televisions in Tuscaloosa. And so uh, I go on, you know, out into the store and, and I'm pushing the buggy and Carol's shopping. Carol's daddy is with us. And so <clears throat> we make our way around through the store getting the things that she thinks she'll need and we passed by this aisle in the grocery store and there was a drunk passed out, literally passed out on the aisle uh, where there was every conceivable type of beverage that one could imagine. I guess the poor guy got there in an inebriated state and just could not make it another step. He was wedged up against the bottom of the aisle uh, sleeping and I'm assuming passed out, drunk, could have been dead for all I know. But whatever the case, people just walking around, I mean, as if this is a common place, everyday kind of thing. And so uh, Carol's daddy uh, was a very prudent and uh, a man of really a few words. And he would get in a great conversation privately with people, but he wasn't one for big, gregarious social conversations and things like that. And he and his, his wife, he and Ms. Lee never, uh, never in any way interfered in our marriage. But that one time coming out of that grocery store, he, he looked at Carol and said, darling, he said, you don't have to stay here if you don't want to. And I was thinking there's no way for us to back out of this thing. Now we're moving to the threshold of hell, you know, for me to go to school. And, and so it was really quite an interesting experience. Well, you know, she said, no, Dad, I've got a job. I'll be fine. I'm not going to be here every day, you know. And so we, we kind of laughed and talked our way through that. Well, in March, we came home on spring break, and I went out to the Christian school where I'd been teaching, and, I, it, you know, the, uh, the classes there were still in session. The break was different in Louisiana. So I'm standing around talking to three or four of the teachers, and I'm giving them a report on my, my missionary enterprise uh, as I observed the lecherous debauchery in the city of New Orleans. And one of the teachers, just he, he just listened to that and he shook his head and he explained, he said, well, I have you know, I would never, ever go to a grocery store or a restaurant that served alcohol. And before I thought, I said, well, brother, I'll be real candid with you. If you lived in New Orleans, you'd sit at home and starve to death because all the grocery stores sell alcohol and all the restaurants serve alcohol. And no one bats an eyelash at it. Well, you know, that's one illustration. Uh, but when we look at this, how are we to respond to that? Growing up in Alabama, you know, we had blue laws. I remember when Alabama shut down, or basically Tuscaloosa shut down on Sunday, and the only thing going on was church. Uh, and and it, was, it was not a 24-hour town like it is now, uh, and it's not a 24-hour town in the sense of some of the big cities, but still, there's activity here now uh, almost 24 hours a day. 
And so I'm thinking about that and working through that and began to realize as I served church there uh, that there were various views on this one particular issue. And in the tradition I was reared in, uh, I was on the threshold of hell when I looked at New Orleans. But for the people who grew up there and for the people in the rural countrysides surrounding the city, uh, they saw that differently. And it was quite a challenge to me to look at that and to begin to recognize that there were people who used alcohol responsibly and there were those who abused it. And I think where it came into focus for me was I, I had a pastor friend a wonderful, wonderful guy that served a neighboring church. And this was really a son. He hammered, he hammered his church, you know, about the use of alcohol. Don't you be drinking and don't you do this. And I want you to understand, I loved him. He's a great guy, but he weighed 400 pounds if he weighed an ounce. And one day, finally, I said, brother, I'm going to be honest with you. I said, the scripture does say that the abuse of alcohol, it teaches that the abuse of alcohol is a sin. And I said, but so is the abuse of food. And they're not going to listen to you uh, until they see some things that are different in your life. And so we had a little bit of a disagreement there. And the later on, we were fine. Uh, but essentially for him to stand up and pound the pulpit when he was so big that he could not open his Bible without breaking a sweat was seen as a hypocritical message in the eyes of those who grew up in that culture where almost every home had wine uh, in the home. And so it was a cultural nuance, even within the confines of our country here in the United States. And so, you know, we have to work on those kinds of things. Where is the responsible use when does sin begin to occur, whether the issue is wine, as Paul mentioned here in Romans 14, or food, as he also mentioned in Romans 14. Now let's change the uh, scenario a little bit. Jeans or dress slacks? What's appropriate for church? Well, I grew up where one wore their Sunday best to church. And, uh, you know, my mother dressed me up and my mess dressed my brother. We go off to church. You know, I was always a little jealous. It's like he could fall off to sleep and she wouldn't chastise him about it. But if I went to sleep, she'd really whack me in the back of the head and wake me up. I guess maybe I needed more of what they were saying. But anyway, you know, this idea of we've got Sunday best clothes and we've got our everyday clothes, uh, you know, those things are issues of, of perception and, and appearance that don't have anything to do with the substance of the heart. In Luke's gospel, and we'll come up on this uh, in our study of Luke, uh, there was this, there's this issue of Jesus being born in a stable. The innkeeper put them up in the stable. Well, there are various veins of thought on that. One vein of thought is it's the only thing he had left. The other was that it's the best that he had that was there. Uh, and so, you know, how we view the innkeeper, of course, is... is is interpreted variously, but when he looked at Mary and Joseph uh, and saw them, he didn't see anything different about them. She did, he did not know that she was carrying the Son of God. Uh, and so, you know, we're down on the innkeeper sometimes. I feel like, you know, the innkeeper did the best he could with what he had, and he didn't leave them out on the street, so to speak. And so, you know, we look at that, but this whole idea of appearances comes into focus. And I'll tell you that uh, on an occasion years ago, uh, I'd grown a beard at that time. And, and uh, you know, my hair and my beard was still dark. And I had the devotional. I was to do the devotional at the end of the holidays for a uh, student group at the local high school. And I couldn't figure out what to do. I was going to be the third preacher to speak that night and the last one. And I finally figured out, okay, I'll go as a homeless person. And so I went to a Goodwill kind of store, bought me some raggedy looking clothes, at least I thought looked homeless, let my hair go ahead and grow for a couple of weeks and, and didn't trim my beard. And so by the time it got there, I was pretty raggedy looking. Well, I wandered up from behind that church and, you know, 
was out in front of the building. There were people watching me as I went in. If I did this today, I'm afraid somebody would shoot me. But, but anyway, I wandered into the building and made my way over to where the youth group was, and the youth minister was the only one that knew that I was playing this game. And so I went through the food part, you know, and got me something to eat. And I mean, it's a Baptist meeting. I got food, right? And homeless people need to eat. So, hey, I got something to eat. And, and so he invited me to sit in the circle. And they were singing a song. And I could tell already from the visual cues that people were uncomfortable. And so they sang this song. And then somebody says, let's sing just one more. And they sang another song. And, and then as we worked into the, to the devotional, uh, the youth minister began to talk to me and ask me some questions and everything like that. And then I had a conversation with a guy who was playing the guitar who I knew to be a minister in a local church that knew me. And so uh, we, we kind of had a funny interaction there when I finally said, okay, uh, you know, this, this, this is who I am. It came out in the conversation. And I said, quick, what'd you all think? You know, and they began to tell me all these things that they thought about this guy coming in. You know, does he have a gun in that bag? You know, who is this guy? Does he have some kind of disease? If I sit next to him, has he bathed? I'm, all these things came into focus in that discussion. And so we had a little fun about it. But then I said, OK, you know, it's Christmas time. And what do you think the innkeeper thought when he saw Mary and Joseph? And we talked about perceptions and reality and how what we see sometimes and think we see is different from the way things really are. And so what the point I want to make with that is this, is that as Baptists, we are very provincial minded. And sometimes our polity sets us up to a certain short sightedness so that we fail to see our own blind spots. And, and so if you have a judgmental spirit towards a person who uses alcohol or eats a certain food, uh, I have a friend in town who is several friends, as a matter of fact, who are vegetarian. They don't eat meat. Hey, look, that's okay. I don't stand in judgment of them. I hope they don't stand in judgment of me. But, but I, want, I want you to understand that if we adopt a judgmental attitude towards another person on the basis of their attire or on the basis of their race or on the basis of the kind of food they eat or don't eat or on the basis uh, perhaps of, of whether or not they use alcohol responsibly or whatever. I don't, you know, take, you take it and apply it wherever you find an application. But I want you to understand that a judgmental spirit toward another person is just as offensive to God as that, as that person's abuse of whatever it is they're involved in. And so we have to be very careful in the way that we view other people uh, and in the way that we conduct our behavior as to not create a circumstance in which we alienate ourselves from God, never realizing that our own attitude is as offensive to Him as their behavior may be offensive to Him. And it may be that if they are living their life responsibly and they are not violating a principle that is always wrong, the moral principles uh, that we talked about uh, on, on Sunday, it may be that what they're doing is perfectly fine in the sight of God. Specifically, I mean, if someone shows up to church in blue jeans, I don't care. I just don't. I don't care. Uh, and, you know, if they show up in a suit and tie, hey, that's fine. If, if it's the appropriate attire for the day, that's great. Uh, but again, don't think that it gets you to the head of the line in the kingdom of heaven because God looks at the heart. Sometimes we have to realize in church that when you gave your life to Jesus and became a part of His church, you did not join Burger King. There's an advertising slogan that Burger King has used for a number of years. It goes like this, have it your way at Burger King. And we all like to have things our way. But the fact is, when we come into the kingdom family of God, we don't come into the church to have it our way. We come into the church to have it God's way. And so it may be that the way you see a particular issue could be exactly the opposite of how Jesus would see it and deal with it. So what are, what are you going to do? Well, 
let's let's just take a quick look here, remembering that Paul said that let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean and it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. Is Paul being double-minded? No, not at all. Essentially, as he said in the earlier part of this chapter, if you're going to eat that food at home, just do what you're going to do and don't make a big issue about it. Uh, there are some things that a person does privately and and if it just if it offends someone else then you know it's the privacy of your home uh, and then at the same time don't intentionally do anything that causes another person to stumble let all things be done for mutual edification and to be sure and strengthen those around us and so look to the scriptures for instruction and principle search God's heart and prayer for wisdom and respond to people in life based on the example of Jesus. And at the end of the day, God will answer the questions and you will come out ahead and He will give you the wisdom that you need to know how to respond to the circumstances in front of you. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word that teaches us. Thank you, Lord, for the wisdom we glean as we look to you. Give each of us the wisdom we need to live faithfully each day that our lives show the example of Jesus in all we say and do, and let Him receive the glory from the way we live and treat others. In His name we pray. Amen.